The Curse of the Pharaohs. This is an ancient Egyptian documentary looking into the cause of the curse and which Egyptian god is responsible for this darkness which is laid upon those that dare open any tomb in ancient Egypt. The Curse of the Pharaohs is a curse alleged to be cast upon anyone who disturbs the mummy of an ancient Egyptian, especially a pharaoh. This curse, which does not differentiate between thieves and archaeologists, it is claimed that it can cause bad luck, illness or even worse. Since the mid 20th century, many authors and documentaries have argued that the curse is real in the sense of having scientifically explicable causes such as bacteria or radiation. And this would be the reason I am here today, which I will explain later in the documentary. The modern origins of Egyptian mummy curse tales, their development primarily in European cultures, the shift from magic to science to explain curses, and their changing uses from condemning disturbance of the dead to entertaining horror film audiences, suggest that Egyptian curses are primarily a cultural and not exclusively a scientific phenomenon. There are occasional instances of genuine ancient curses appearing inside or on the front of a tomb as in the case of the Mastaba of Kehenteka Echehi of the 6th dynasty at Saqqar. These appear to be directed towards the Ka priest to protect the tomb carefully and preserve its ritual purity rather than as a warning for potential robbers. There had been stories of curses going back to the 19th century but they multiplied after Howard Carter's discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun. Despite popular misconceptions, no curse was found inscribed in the pharaoh's tomb. The evidence for the curses relating to King Tutankhamun is considered to be so meager that Donald B. Redford viewed it as unadulterated claptrap. Stay tuned, Donald will soon regret those words. Curses relating to tombs are extremely rare, possibly because the idea of such desecration was unthinkable and considered dangerous to record in writing. They most frequently occur in private tombs of the Old Kingdom era. The tomb of Anktifi, 9th to 10th dynasty, contains the warning, any ruler who shall do evil or wickedness to this coffin, may Hemen, who was a local deity, not accept any goods he offers, and may his heir not inherit. The tomb of Kentika Ikehi, also 9th to 10th dynasty, contains the inscription, as for all men who shall dare enter this my tomb, impure, there will be judgment, an end shall be made for him. I shall seize his neck like a bird. I shall cast the fear of myself into him. Curses after the Old Kingdom era are less common, though more severe, sometimes invoking the ire of Tehut or the destruction of Sekhmet. The ire of Tehut. The word ire meaning anger, rage, wrath and fury, a very dark side to the god of wisdom and light. Tehut and the month of martyrdom. Zahi Hawass quotes an example of a curse. Cursed be those who disturb the rest of a pharaoh, that they shall break the seal of this tomb, shall meet death by a disease that no doctor can diagnose. Zahi Hawass recalled that as a young archaeologist excavating at Qom Abu below, he had to transport several artifacts from the Greco-Roman site. His cousin died on that day, 
his uncle died on its first anniversary, and on the third anniversary, his aunt died. Years later, when he excavated the tombs of the builders of the pyramids at Giza, he encountered the curse. All people who enter this tomb, who will make evil against this tomb and destroy it, may the crocodile be against them in water and the snakes against them on land. May the hippopotamus be against them in water, the scorpion on land. The belief in a curse was brought to many people's attention due to the deaths of a few members of Howard Carter's team and other prominent visitors to the tomb shortly thereafter. Carter's team opened the tomb of Tutankhamun in 1922 launching the modern era of Egyptology. The famous Egyptologist James Henry Breasted worked with Carter soon after the first opening of the tomb. He reported how Carter sent a messenger on an errand to his house. On approaching his home, the messenger thought he heard a faint, almost human cry. Upon reaching the entrance, he saw the birdcage occupied by a cobra, the symbol of Egyptian monarchy. Carter's canary had died in the mouth of the tomb, and this fueled local rumors of a curse. Arthur Wiegel, a previous Inspector General of Antiquities to the Egyptian government, was reported that this was interpreted as Carter's house being broken into by the Royal Cobra, the same that was worn on the King's head to strike enemies on the very day the king's tomb was broken into. A study of documents and scholarly sources led the Lancelot to conclude that it was unlikely that Carnarvon's death had anything to do with Tutankhamun's tomb, refuting another theory that exposure to toxic fungi, mycotoxins, had contributed to his demise. I do not think this should have been refuted at all. Amanita muscaria was the food of the gods. It would make sense that Tutankhamun was provided with this mushroom for his journey in the afterlife. Scattered amid Tutankhamun's other treasures, Carter discovered the fixings for royal feasts in the great beyond. More than 100 finely woven baskets held the remains of plant-based foods. The Lancet report points out that the Earl was only one of many to enter the tomb on several occasions and that none of the others were affected. The cause of Carnarvon's death was reported as pneumonia supervening on facial erispalas. The other names for erispalas are Ignis Caesar, Holy Fire, and St. Anthony's Fire, a streptococcal infection of the skin and underlying soft tissue. Pneumonia was thought to be the only one of various complications arising from the progressively invasive infection that eventually resulted in multi-organ failure. The Earl had been prone to frequent and severe lung infections, according to the Lancet that one acute attack of bronchitis could have killed him. If he was in such a debilitated state, the Earl's immune system would have been easily overwhelmed by Erispalas. My point with the Amanita muscaria is that it is part of the deadly Amanita mushroom family. Oddly enough, Amanita virosa first appears as a white egg-shaped object covered with a universal veil. That does sound familiar, doesn't it? A very different cosmic egg. The mushroom spores are almost etheric. They are everywhere, yet nowhere. If Tutankhamun's tomb had offerings that lay there molding for over 3,000 years, the spores would have been as dust, and opening the tomb would have filled the space with those deadly spores. Long-term exposure to mushroom spores can lead to lung inflammation and acute lung disease. 
Symptoms of acute hypersensitivity, pneumontis, typically occur four to six hours after you leave the area where exposure took place. In the current state of affairs, these symptoms are very familiar. Symptoms may include chills, fever, cough, and shortness of breath. This is not the only element I see within the tomb. What I believe has been overlooked is the decoration of the tomb. It is decorated with the poisonous raw red clay. So what would be the result of the serpent's venom and the mushroom spores? I believe it is vital breath, the Aya, the anger of Tehut, who is none other than the god of alchemy. The hoot and the word, the vital breath. This is apparently the vital breath that held DNA. In relation to the mystical food for the departed, I stumbled upon this. I am that egg who was in the great cackla. This incantation makes reference to the Hermopolitan cosmogony, according to which a goose deity or gander had laid the egg containing vital breath. Here I remind you that Shu is to hoot under another guise. I am Shu, god of the air, he who gives birth to the breeze before the luminous Ra in every corner of the earth. So here we can see my very different but logical definition of vital breath. But Shutu, the wind demon of Anu, is also the god of the air, he who gives birth to the breeze for Anu. Which leads me to the term Jus Spiritus. The original term was Numa Hagios. Numa in Greek is literally that which is breathed or blown. The word is holy. God is holy, and the spirit of God is holy. The fundamental and core meaning of the word hagios is different and unlike the rest. So when the Bible says that God is holy, it means that God is different from all else. So the term dios spiritus means that which is breathed or blown, that which is different from all else. What is divided every 365 days? What was, what is, and is yet to come? What is different and unlike the rest? Please hit that notification bell to ensure that you are notified of each upload. Share, like, comment, and subscribe to support the channel for more Mythology 7 documentaries.